York, New York, big city of dreams. New York, New York, big city of dreams. What's going on? This is Jayless from Nick of Time Show. Here, give you that Nick's talk just in the nick of time bringing you our first off-season nick stream and it's a big one tonight ladies and gentlemen but we're going to get to the details of this off-season nick stream but before we do that you already know what it is i have to introduce my guest and first and foremost you know what i like to call him i like to call him the raw metaphor it is the raw hebrew remnant what's going on raw what's up j ellis we doing things we doing things all right shout out to my man from the youtube channel across the street and also you already know what this is man it is the man the myth the legend the guy with the stats and the facts ig is in the building i'm just i'm just glad to be here tonight absolutely absolutely and you already know who this man is this man needs no introduction he's been holding down the ny post since was it 1999 99, 2000, yeah. Nine, the first I don't know why I thought it was. I thought it was longer than that. I thought you were in there from the mid nineties, but <laughs> no, I just joined them after the NBA Finals, uh, and it's been kind of downhill ever since. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. First season. Yeah. But yeah, Ellis Raw and Ryan, thanks so much for inviting me on. Uh, my twenty second season is in the books, but you know this off season is going to be fat fascinating because leon rose has his work cut out for him yeah absolutely man yeah he most definitely do and you've seen it all you've been there for 1999 when we was actually in the finals you saw the you saw the the kp era you saw phil jackson you saw jeremy lynn you've seen numerous amounts of coaches all sorts of players so when you compare everything you've seen to this season and this cast of players I meaning the coaches and, and the players like do you feel like there's a chance that we can move this ship into the right direction when you compare it to everything that we've seen before this season <laughs> i hate to say it but i have covered this team 22 years and i've always understood the future plan but this plan is not as clear cut. I will have to say Leon Rose and William Wesley, uh, Brock Aller, Scott Perry, they keep a tight lid on things. We know for sure that their big goal is to make a, a blockbuster trade this off season. And they're hoping something shakes loose. Mm. And I think that's a plan that's not very solid. They want to build the young group and they want to get another lottery pick, and they are very happy with the last two draft classes and very happy with R.J. Barrett, but now they don't know what they have in Julius Randle. Right. So that's a vexing issue. And now they feel they have to make a blockbuster move and get a superstar in, this, in the garden because Julius Randle has disappointed them they thought they had their superstar with RJ coming right along next to him. And that's no longer the case. And without cap space, you know, free agency is not going to be so easy. So it's concerning. I'll be honest. I'm concerned about the future plan. I, I agree with you there. I, I don't know. I feel like we're not in the place right now to actually make a big move for like a Zion Williamson or, or Donovan Mitchell personally. I feel like we still have to let these young guys cook and see the fruits of our labor. Well, uh. yeah, JLS, I will say something about uh, the Zion Williamson situation. I have been convinced that Zion is going to force his way out of New Orleans, mm. but I will admit, watching the Pelicans last night, there's some pieces there. And, you know, I know they were under 500, but they're in the play-in and they have a chance to get into the playoffs. And then McCollum trade and that young rookie, Herb Jones, and uh, this big center, Jonas. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I mean, th there are pieces where 
if Zion comes in, and even that young New Yorker, Jose Alvarado, is a good bench player, uh, there's some pieces where Zion could say, you know what, let me come back next season and let's see what we can do. Uh, so I don't think Zion is going to be forcing any trades this offseason. Uh, a couple of months ago, I thought, wow, there's a chance. But, but you know, and we didn't mention Ingram either, right. uh, who's a very talented player and had a very nice night uh, last night. So I'm starting to wonder if Zion gives New Orleans a chance. Yeah, that's a good point. Yes, yeah, so um, Mark Berman, I'll go. I'm, I'm going to go on to the second question. So I know you just discussed um, – the Knicks don't really have a clear-cut plan going into the offseason. So I want to ask you, if you were in the front office running operations for the Knicks, what would be your first priority move for the Knicks going into the offseason? I mean, no doubt they need a point guard, Ryan. I mean, Alec Burks, I mean, it was, it was frustrating to watch not having a real point guard on the floor uh, after Kemba Walker quit the team. And, you know, it's just so mysterious still with Kemba. At the All-Star break, Kemba thought Derrick Rose was coming back. He knew he'd probably be yanked out of the rotation again, didn't want to be part of that. And as it turned out, Derrick never uh, actually returned. And Kemba could have been the starting point guard, and we wouldn't have had to see Alec Burks. But they need a point guard, and it's, again, no free agents, uh, no cap space. Jalen Brunson definitely on their radar. I'm told the Mavericks really like them. And I'm doing a playoff preview in tomorrow's paper. And that Dallas Mavericks, Utah Jazz showdown, Knicks fans should be watching that closely. Because if the Jazz get eliminated, uh, you know, and they're out in the first round, who knows what Donovan Mitchell might do. And if the Mavericks make a nice run during these playoffs, Jalen may want to first stay in Dallas and Mark Cuban may say, all right, he's worth 20 million a year. I don't think Dallas thinks he's worth 20 million a year right now, but I think if things uh, look good in the playoffs for them, you know, they could try to keep this together. Yeah. Personally, I'm not looking for Jalen Brunson, but that's just, just me personally. <laughs> yeah, me neither. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> he's not worth 20 million a year. Yeah, I'm not looking for Jalen Brunson personally. I feel yeah. like twenty million is is too much to spend on him. It's too much. And yeah. listen, he's undersized. Uh, the thing about Jalen is he's an old school point guard, and I feel the Knicks do need an old school point guard, a quarterback who's going to feed Randall, who's going to set up Obi, uh, even Mitchell Robinson if somehow he comes back. I feel they didn't have a playmaker at that position. Alec Burks is not a playmaker. He's a Bench wing scorer. That's what Alec Burks is. He's not Absolutely. a point guard. He can defend yeah, a point guard position. And they feel that Jalen could really open things up for that offense, which really struggled this season. But I listen, Jalen has a lot of faults, including listen, he's a hard nosed player and it's just like his father was, but he's undersized and he could get bullied on defense. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Just like a lot of these guys, it's like I, I Q can sometimes, just like Kemba did. Um, I know Ryan yeah. has a question regarding Kemba. Yeah, so I want to trace back to Kemba. So I know you said that Kemba quit on the team this season. Have you heard anything about Kemba? Is there a chance that Kemba will be on the roster next season, or, or do you believe that he's, that he's going to be gone? I mean, I think they're going to try to trade him. What happened at the, at the deadline, uh, at the, deadline, at the uh, All-Star break, is they would have liked to buy out, but the Knicks feel that Kemba – has trade value not only can he still play but he's an expiring contract so a team could take on an expiring contract uh as well so they didn't want to buy him out and i think they're going to try to trade him in a package uh maybe even on draft night i cannot imagine he's back on this roster tom thibodeau would didn't even want to talk about him we would ask him after the all-star break what's kemba up to he had no idea. All he'd say is, that's Leon and the agent. And we reported that he was in Charlotte working out, not even with any Knicks trainers. I would say there's a 0% chance Kemba Walker is back with the Knicks. And it's a tragic story. This could have been a nice fairy tale. Thibodeau gave up on him pretty quickly, mostly because of his defensive or his lack of uh, defensive prowess. Yeah. Doesn't like those undersized point guards who just, Kim has never been a good defensive player, and in Thibodeau's defensive system, it just did not work. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, I agree yeah, with you. That makes sense. I, I agree. I feel like his, he was a defensive liability for sure. Um, personally, I also feel like Tibbs didn't use him properly. He was one of the best pick and roll point guards um, in the NBA, and we didn't really run pick and roll with him. But I digress. That's a that's a whole other story. Um, I know you kind of talked about this before that Kemba kind of was like a, a point of contention with this team, and there was a little bit of drama there, and. Also, in general, I feel like Randall has been uh, – he, he's been a little bit off since December. And from December till now, at least towards the end of the season, it seemed like team camaraderie has kind of been on an uptick, maybe because the young guys are playing in IQ and RJ and OB are all enjoying themselves. Have you found there's been a difference in camaraderie leading from December until the end of the season? Or is it still all the same in your eyes? I mean, it, it's obvious. It's obvious to the naked eye that when Randall's not on the court, the team looks like they're sharing the ball more and they're having more fun. And it seemed like Julius was just too much Randall. He, was, he had the ball too much, and I think that hurt Kemba Walker also. Kemba wasn't able to run the show because Randall was sort of the point forward I think Thibodeau needed to make an adjustment. He never made it. Yeah. Randall was yeah. not the leader they needed him to be. And yeah, team camaraderie was terrific last season. That was one of their strong points. In fact, they didn't want to even make any trades at the deadline or sign anyone significant late in the season because they loved that locker room. And then this season, the locker room is not the same. Uh, I don't think Evan and Julius really hit it off on or off the court. Mm. Uh, Julius mm. is very sensitive and he, Listen, I will defend Julius on this one point. Okay. I think the Knicks fans were too quick to give up on him and start souring on him early in the, early in the season when he was struggling a bit and being a little too unselfish, uh, rather too selfish. I think fans on social media and even in the arena, uh, I think they gave up too quickly. And Julius is very sensitive, and he couldn't believe it. He, he thought he had won these fans over for life. He signed this long-term extension. He was an all-star, second-team All-NBA. He just couldn't believe that all of a sudden how fickle they were. And it all kept snowballing until that horrible night when he gave the thumbs-down gesture and then explained it afterward in a profane manner. But, yeah, the camaraderie with Randall just wasn't there. And that's why Obi Toppin is such an integral part of this franchise now as R.J. Barrett. Everyone loves Obi. Thibodeau keeps talking about how Obi is the most energetic guy, compared him to Taj Gibson in the intangible department, how he always is lifting everyone's spirits. And yes, it's a different atmosphere when Julius was not around. You can see it. Even Julius Randall himself looked happier when he was on the bench, which is which is interesting. I don't think I've seen that guy smile <laughs> for four months while he was playing. They were chanting Obi and actually saw him smile, which which was very interesting towards yeah. the end of the bench. Well, 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 what was hurtful though, and it was his final game, and then he shut it down for the final five games. But in the final game he played, when he was on the court, they were chanting Obi, and that hurt him. And in fact. Another time, I remember what seemed to really bother him. He was at the free throw line earlier in the season, and they were chanting RJ's name. So the fans were kind of sticking it to him. And again, he's a sensitive guy. And maybe this offseason, he could talk to people and, you know, just figure it out and understand that New York is a different animal and you got to take criticism. And hopefully he could come back a different with a different mindset. Otherwise, they just got to trade him. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Heaviest, heaviest jersey in the league you cannot be fickle. And I, I always say, I've been saying this lately. If you hustle on defense and then dunk and scream to the crowd a few times, we come right back to you, Julius. I'm, I'm giving you the gems right now. <laughs> dunk, <laughs> scream, ah, that's it. The fans are right yeah. back in your lap. That's it. But you got to play defense. For real. <laughs> if you don't play defense, you're totally right. And, <laughs> yeah. And even after the uh, a thumbs down gesture, it wasn't a genuine apology. Like he did it on Instagram Absolutely. and we're told that like, who knows who wrote it. Uh, he, he needed to have a little press conference and genuinely talk about how sorry he was. And he let frustrations get the better of him. 
Instead, he did the Instagram. And then when we got him next at practice, he said, I already said what I had to say on Instagram. And that was the wrong way to handle it. Absolutely. He should have kept the apology going. He did not. Fans never warmed up to him the rest of the season. Yeah, it, it was obvious that it was it was ingenuine to, to most people. I mean, we already know what the machine did. The machine wrote the letter for him and he just signed it. We get it. But um, <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned Obi before, right? Um, so do you think the, the success of Obi Toppin, although it's a small sample size, uh, will make the front office prioritizing, prioritize, I'm sorry, moving Randall in all season? And also, um, gives, I'm sorry, yeah. I'm sorry. And also, do you, what do you feel like the Knicks would like to receive in return for Randall if they actually were able to move him? I mean, J. Alice, that's a great question, but I do believe what you said. What Obi did late in the season definitely motivates the Knicks to look harder at trading Julius. At the trade deadline, Obi was in a slump. He couldn't hit a three-point shot, and Thibodeau didn't trust him. And the big thing about what Obi did late in the season is he got Thibodeau's trust now. I'm told that Thibodeau is almost regretful that he didn't turn more to the younger players Ooh. earlier. Ooh. Wow. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait, 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 wait a minute. Wait. Breaking news. We got that on tape. We got that Breaking on tape. news. Could you say that again? <laughs> I mean, I have nothing specific, but I think Obi is part of that equation, that he, he regrets maybe not giving him more time. And let's be honest. Obi had a confidence issue, and he explained it on a couple of occasions late in the season when we spoke to him. He said, I was afraid anytime I made a mistake, I'd be pulled out of the game. Absolutely. And, you know, that's how Thibodeau coaches. Some coaches let the young players play through their mistakes. Tom doesn't believe in that. If you're not helping the team, you're out of the game. You earn your playing time. So it was tough for Obi. And then when Obi excelled so much, Thibodeau finally saw so many different things about his intangibles and how he lifted his teammates, went, giving them energy. When he runs the floor, everyone else <laughs> runs the floor. When he makes an, an exciting dunk, it lifts the spirits of everybody. And the three-point shot is crucial, and he was starting to make that three-point shot instead of not even looking to shoot, which if you noticed earlier in the season, he would get the ball at the perimeter. He wouldn't look at the basket. And he would hand off. And I think that frustrated Thibodeau. Yeah, yeah. He was frustrated too, because every time he did do well, he was pulled from the game for Randall. But that's that's a, that's another that's, that's a whole nother thing, man. That's a whole nother thing. Yeah. But the, the second part to that question, um, what do you think the Knicks are looking for in a trade for Randall? Right. Well, it wouldn't be a, another power forward. Uh, you know, <laughs> this, this move would be made to alleviate that logjam. Right. So listen, they may lose Mitchell. They may need a serviceable center and draft picks. They would obviously love a point guard. I mean, we heard about the De'Aaron Fox possibility at the trade deadline. Neither a team uh, really wanted to to pull the trigger there. Uh, listen, Indiana has Miles Turner, a stretch five. The Knicks need a, a, a center who could shoot the ball from the outside. They don't have one on the roster. Yeah. Uh, they also have a nice point guard in Malcolm Brogdon. I think the Pacers are still blowing it up. So, you know, the fact is Randall's trade value has lessened. There's no question because of how he, not only how he performed on the court, but how he conducted himself off the court. He got fined uh, several times, had uh, altercations with players, he had altercation with an assistant coach. He stopped going to the national anthem lineup and to the pregame uh, starting lineup introductions on the road. I mean, there were a lot of weird issues with Julius, which yeah. hurts his trade value. But I still think he has value because he's still a very talented player, as Thibodeau and Leon Rose pointed out, averaged a 20, 10, and 5. Only two other players did that this season. Absolutely. Absolutely. Go ahead, Ryan. Yeah, all right. So, Mark, Mark Berman, I have another question. So, I know you mentioned Mitch. Do you think the Knicks have, have it as high, pro high priority to re-sign Mitch this upcoming season, or do you think the Knicks, the Knicks are going to probably move on from Mitch and sign a serviceable center, as you said? I mean, Leon Rose made it seem like they still want to try to do something before he hits free agency, said the other night, we're going to talk to them until July 1st to try to 
see if we could do something. Are they offering $55 million, the maximum they could offer? I don't know. Does, does Foucher, Foucher think that they could, the agent think that they could get more in the open market? It might be a risk. There aren't a ton of teams looking for traditional centers, which Mitchell is. He's not a, he's not a new age center. He's a shot blocker. He's a rebounder. He's going to score inside. Uh, so listen, Mitchell, ha what he does well, he does great, but he, there's still holes in his game. If, if Leon could get him, you know, before free agency and Mitchell, who's been underpaid for four years, he might just grab the money and not risk it. So it's, it, the good sign is it sounds like Leon does want him back and does want to make him another contract offer. And we'll see what happens. I just know that Mitchell has been disappointed in how he's been used mm -hmm. offensively. He feels he should get a, a bigger role in the offense, more involved, not just be a, a lob guy and a, a putback guy off offensive rebounds. He wants a little more action. So it's a great question. Tom Thibodeau said after the season, yeah, I want to re-sign Mitchell, but this is a business. Yeah. Yeah, makes sense. All right. Go ahead, Ruff. Hey, Mr. Berman, since um, it was rumored, I think you reported it, that the front office at the trade deadline or before the All-Star break wasn't particularly happy with Mr. Thibodeau and, in fact, maybe wanted to fire him. But it appears that Leon is still sticking with him. So do you think if next season starts off poorly that Tom would be on the hot seat no question. No question about it. Mm. I reported that at least two members of the front office recommended to Leon uh, that, that he has lost the team and it might be wise to let Thibodeau go. Leon wanted nothing of it. He completely still believes in Thibodeau because, listen, this was his big hire. You know, he, when he became the Knicks president, he talked about his relationships Gonna, it was going to help him draw free agents, what have you. Well, so far, all his relationships have brought is Tom Thibodeau. Thibodeau came to the Knicks because of Leon Rose. Leon was his agent in a past lifetime. Uh, he believes in Leon. He trusts Leon. That's why he chose it. He could have waited for the other teams to come out of the bubble, and there were a lot of vacancies, and I think he may have gotten an offer. He could have gotten an offer elsewhere. But he chose the Knicks uh, before any of the other offers uh, openings occurred. So the fact that Leon was going to stick with his guy is not a shock. But I will say, if things get off to a rotten start next season, you could definitely start the countdown on the Thibodeau watch. Mm -hmm. Is Johnny Bryan, who's, whose title is associate head coach, would he be considered the successor if that happened? I mean, if w William Wesley calls the shots, certainly so. He mm. uh, was behind Johnny Bryant's hiring. Uh, he wanted Woodson also, as well as Kenny Payne. William uh, thought that, that Thibodeau's, Thibodeau needed a more diverse staff. Uh, he didn't want to just have him hire his old guys from Chicago and Minnesota. So he brought in Johnny Bryant. And we've made the connection about Johnny's close relationship with Donovan Mitchell uh, back in Utah. I saw them talking after the game in Utah uh, in March or whenever it was uh, when we were out there. So, I mean, if Johnny Bryan is head coach, <laughs> who knows? Maybe yeah. Donovan Mitchell actually decides, hey, he loves New York anyway. He spends his off seasons in New York. Uh, he wanted to get drafted by the Knicks. So if Johnny Bryan is head coach, you know, maybe Donovan finally does ask for a trade. But, yeah, there's no doubt that that I don't think that Tom Thibodeau, if Johnny Bryan moved on, like Kenny Payne and Mike Woodson, I don't think Thibodeau would blink an eye. In fact, we someone asked Thibodeau about Johnny Bryan as an assistant coach, and he kind of mentioned he's a very good young coach, and then he started talking about the other guys on the side. Oh, oh, oh. So, <laughs> man. He's, literally, his title is associate head coach. That's Johnny's title, associate head coach. Right. So, um, listen, Johnny has great relationships with the players, and he actually was very close with Kemba Walker and tried to get him through a very tough time 
Mm. Although it did not work out in the end. That's that's very interesting. Uh, especially I, I feel like I heard you say before that he doesn't even use his um, assistant coaches as offensive offensive uh, as for offensive advice during the games. So um, this leads me to this next question, right? So the front office seems like they have a lot of input. They seem like they had input in Jericho Sims getting playing time. Um, so do you think the front office will push Tom to prioritize playing guys like Cam Reddish next season, who we have invested interest in, right? Because we, we traded a, a first round pick for him in Kevin Knox. And do you also feel like they will have Tom actually be more open to involving an offensive coordinator in the offense? Wow. I mean, Tom is very stubborn. Uh, it would be... <laughs> It would be very tough for Tom. His ego would be hurt if, if there was a demand, you have to hire an offensive coordinator. I think they should hire a shooting coach. Their free throw shooting this season was terrible, and they did decline from the three-point uh, line. But in terms of an offensive coordinator, I would say that that's unlikely, and definitely they wouldn't term it that way. They do have an opening now. But you know, to your point before about assistant coaches, during a game, Tom doesn't consult with those guys. He knows what he wants to do. He knows the game plan better than anyone. He's st the one great thing about Tom, when the advanced scouts hand in their uh, documentation on the upcoming team, he reads every word of it. So he doesn't mm -hmm. have to consult with anyone. And basically his assistants are there for practice and to motivate the guys in the locker room, right. but not for in-game strategy. But offensive coordinator, I would be very surprised if that's the way they go, I mean, they may hire an assistant coach that has some offensive uh, background, a, a more offensive background than defensive background, but they would def definitely never brand it as an offensive coordinator. I, I can see they make it. I guess they would just have them utilize him more and not really announce it to the public. That might be the best way to do it without bruising his ego. Yeah. But still with strategy, I mean, Tom is, he's the guy. I mean, he, he never, Every other coach, it seems, he's talking to his assistants and getting their input. Tom just goes, they call a timeout. Tom goes right to the huddle, uh, bends down, you know, with, with the guys and starts to steal. He know, and Tom was very vocal after the season when he was talking about, he was taking a shot at me in the media. He was saying, listen, unlike you guys, I watched the games three times. Oh, we saw that. After. <laughs> we had a discussion yeah. about that. He was very adamant. There is nothing that is going to escape me. I am working my butt off. So all this criticism on social media, I don't pay attention to because I know they're not watching the game three times. And, uh, you know, and then he wouldn't even evaluate the season as a whole. He said he needed a week to two weeks to go over every game and analyze what went wrong. He said, I got to dig deep to figure this out. He needs to follow the Knicks film school guys and realize that they, they we do watch film three right, times. I, I think we do watch film. I think, I, think, I, think I think there's I think there's a bit of a disconnect because he's taking it as if we believe he's not working hard. We believe he's working hard. Absolutely. He's just not working smart, and that's that's the problem we have. He's not he's not actually strategizing in the year 2022. He's going back to 2010, and and it's not that he's not working hard. It's just that he's not really adjusting to today's NBA. Well, Roy, you're right. I mean, I, I think that his reputation as the hardest working coach in the NBA still stands, Facts. but he's very stubborn and he believes that Alec Burks from a defensive standpoint, he likes the tall point guard defensively and he feels it's positionless basketball and he was going to ride that to the end and he did. He wrote it to the very, very end to the last game which I was, I mean, listen, quickly started that last game with Burks in the backcourt because of RJ's injury. But if RJ didn't get hurt, uh, it would have been Burks and RJ and Fournier in that final uh, game on Sunday. Yeah, right. most definitely. Um, so I know you said that when you said when I asked earlier about, you know, if you were the GM, what would be your first priority? You said the Knicks getting a point guards. And you also said that Thibs, also, it seems like he has more trust in the young players as the season went on. So the question I have is, if he had to take a guess, what is more likely next season? Would Derrick Rose be the starting point guard? Would IQ be the starting point guard? Or would the Knicks search free agency or trade to bring in a starting point guard? Yeah, I think they're going to be desperate 
to try to sign uh, a new point guard. I think even Thibodeau realizes you can't count on Derrick Rose to be your starting point guard. At best, he's your backup point guard. And in fact, when they traded for him last season, they traded him to be the backup to Alfred Payton. Uh, naturally, he was elevated into starters minutes, but he still came off the bench. But yeah, they're desperate to get a starting point guard in there uh, after Brunson. I mean, like there's some guys out there that are free agents, like the kid from Memphis. Right. I think it's Jones, Tyus Jones. Mm-hmm. I mean, they can get him, you know, in the mid-level exception uh, type deal because they're over the cap. Uh, but they're going to have to clear cap room if they're going to, you know, go out after a Jalen, for instance. Uh, but in a trade or, you know, unfortunately this draft doesn't have a lot of playmaking point guards. The Jaden Ivy kid is going to be gone by four. And, you know, the Knicks have a 7% chance of getting up there. And I know they like Jaden, but he's still not like a great passer. He could develop into one, but he's more of a combo guard. But it's, you know, last, last summer was the time. There was a lot of free Asian point guards, even the, the kid Reggie Jackson was a free agent. You're right. <laughs> they, they campaign. I, there was a lot of point guards on the market, and they had the most cap space. And they wound up with Kemba Walker, who won scout right after the trade. Uh, after they signed him, they're like, "Did they watch Kemba play last season?" <laughs> <laughs> they on one leg. Absolutely. Brad Stevens knew it. Brad Stevens, the very first thing he did was trade Kemba Walker and, and attach an asset to get rid of him. Yeah, I drank the Kool-Aid wow. too. Yeah. I'm not even going to lie. I drank wow. the Kool-Aid. Wow. Wow. Yeah, I drank, me too. I drank it. I, I was like Kemba Walker. I was like Kemba Walker here in New York. You know, fairy tale story. Welcome back, Kemba. But uh, yeah. I, I, gave the benefit, I gave him the benefit of the doubt. I thought they would have done due diligence on his knee and, and on his background before they did. And I thought they did. So I thought we were getting 19 point per game Kemba. And uh, as it turns out, they didn't, and he didn't. So, yeah. Uh, so, Mark, I, I do think that he lost some confidence because Thibodeau, when Thibodeau yanked him out of the starting line of Alec Burks, it was a little quick. He was struggling defensively, but I think because of Kemba's uh, history and his Bronx heritage and all yeah. that, he deserved a little more respect uh, than getting yanked that soon. Mm. So, Mark, okay, so. Tibbs is said to really like Deuce, uh, Deuce McBride. His history shows, though, when I looked at his history and from what I remember, he has never started a rookie point guard. So I don't think it was realistic for us to think that he was going to get any starters minutes. But do you believe that Deuce would be seeing more rotation minutes in year two? Definitely. I think another regret of uh, Thibodeau's was not giving Miles a bigger look. And one of the disappointing parts was after he got COVID. So he, so Miles uh, in the Houston game, when we were in Houston, had a spectacular game. Derrick Rose had to sit the second half. Miles came in at point guard and was a, a, he, he looked like the floor general that they needed. And then all of a sudden, the next day, he had COVID. Right. And then when he came back, he was out of the loop. Uh, but the disappointing part was when, he, when Thibodeau started giving him minutes late in the season, he was playing off the ball uh, with Emmanuel. So he couldn't show his, his strength. He was a quarterback in high school and he's a quarterback on the basketball court. He's a pretty good passer and he has good vision and he throws the ball ahead, but the Knicks were really dedicated to seeing IQ as a point guard. And that went to the detriment of seeing more of miles on the ball. But I think next season, uh, there'll be more of an opportunity, but we'll see who they bring in. I mean, right. Free agency, if they're bringing in a point guard that's going to play 35 minutes a night or 32 minutes a night, you know, mm-hmm. Miles is back to square one, sort of. So yeah. a lot depends on the offseason, but definitely a regret from Thibodeau not seeing more of Miles on the ball. Do you believe like that? OK, so I'm getting conflicting information from what you're saying and what I heard Leon Rose say. Leon Rose, have, tell me if I'm wrong, but I've heard him say he wants to build the right way. And he said, and, and his actions show that because if you look at the last two drafts, he's done a tremendous job mm-hmm. of gathering young assets. So with that being the case, why doesn't he just 
at least he could he doesn't have to come out with his own press conference he could he could float it through ian begley or yourself or whoever and say that they're rebuilding with these young people that kind of conflicts don't you think with the idea of saying we need to bring a big star in here Absolutely. because generally speaking big stars don't come unless they see you already got something going right so the to me the most important line that leon said was if an opportunity arrives, we're going to be very flexible. Not just flexible, very flexible. That he was saying, if if there's a star that wants out, we're going to go after it. And he's building up his young players strategically to increase their tra trade value. He wants to say as much positive stuff about these young guys because let's be honest. If they're going to make a trade for Donovan Mitchell, they're going to have to put a couple of these young players in a deal. So you want to build them up. And uh, and he did a good job, I thought, in that interview of, of really hitting home on some of these young players and how they have advanced, even Jericho Sims. So I, I know, listen, we know the strategy. They have a lot of flexibility in terms of their contracts. They didn't sign long-term deals. They have a handful of expiring contracts like Noel, Kemba, even Derek Rose. Uh, so they will be, if their opportunity arises where there's a player like Donovan or Lillard who wants to trade or Zion, that they're going to try to put together a package with these, you know, friendly contracts with a couple of these young players. As the fallback, yeah, we got to develop our young guys, but I think with Tom Thibodeau as your coach, you need to bring in a star, especially since Julius Randle does not look like an all-star anymore. I'm hoping next season it's a different story with Julius, but he really did not look like a star able to handle the pressure of New York City. Yeah, yeah, and, and uh, so, okay, so that being the case, then what you're saying, I just want to make clear, so... He's flexible. Leon's going to stay flexible. And he's saying, we're going to continue to build up these young guys. But if I see a deal out here or if somebody wants to come here, I'm prepared to pounce. Yes. And, okay. that, and that's, yeah, that's how it has to be because Tom Thibodeau, he's not the most patient guy in the world. And he's going to be pushing. If there's a star on the market, he's going to push to try to put together a package with draft picks and young players to bring in the star. Listen, let's be honest. The draft class of 2020 and 2021, it's very nice. There's a lot of good value picks. Is there a star in that whole group? I don't know. Obi Toppin looks like he's going to be a solid starting power forward. Is he going to be an all-star? I'm really – I think it's a little bit of a long shot to say that right now. Yeah, I mean, he has to work on um, creating his own shots, but, you know, I feel like there's a path for success depending on what kind of point guard we have who can actually feed him the ball. That's, that's just me personally. Um, but, Mark, so you have, like, one of the most interesting relationships with Knicks fans I've ever seen. Like, a lot of fans feel like you purposely take pessimistic approach to articles, but there's also fans who also feel like that you ask Tibbs, like, the real questions and they appreciate you for that. So how do you deal with the fan criticism um, with your day-to-day, -day? especially because you're very active on Twitter and so you see everything? Yeah, listen, I think that uh, I like the fans and their feedback, even if it's negative, because it shows how much they care. If they care about the Knicks speed rider, imagine how much they care about this whole franchise. Mm -hmm. And the, the passion these fans are showing, especially this season during a down season, I mean, there's no indifference. I mean, yeah. they are just, it, when things are going bad, they're going to voice their opinion. And if I'm writing a negative story and they don't believe in it, they're going to let me know. And that's what Twitter is all about. And that's the new age. And I will never block anyone. Uh, I've been on the record saying that you could attack me and attack me. And I will not block someone on Twitter. I, I want to hear what they have to say. And when I did that R.J. Barrett story, it was maybe taken out of context. All I said was, is he definitely worth the rookie max of 185 million or 181 million, considering his shooting percentages are kind of mediocre. But uh, as far as asking Thibodeau tough questions, I mean, 
I think now in this era, because everything's on Zoom and the next videos, next video, uh, the website is filming everything. They see it, but I've been at it 22 years doing this. This yeah. is nothing new. I'm in the locker room. You know, the cameras aren't there and it's the same thing. But listen, <laughs> I, I enjoy when Julius Randle comes back at me and R.J. Barrett. And like, oh, it makes it fun. This was a tough season. Relax, <laughs> Berman. That's like my favorite yeah, thing to say. Oh, my God. <laughs> No, no. I, love, I may have even retweeted one of the videos of it. But last season was such a joy. And it was one of, one of my favorite all-time seasons, especially that game one of the playoffs against Atlanta when the Garden was finally packed. Absolutely. And this season was really tough. And I understand the frustrations. I understand the frustrations of Julius and RJ. And, you know, again, we're, we've, we're together all year. And now we have a break from each other, thank God. But I understand, you know, they, they, they do read. I mean, in this era of social media, they do see the stuff. So uh, I don't mind them getting out their frustrations. And I'm willing to take it. It's, my, it's part of the job. It's part of the territory. And uh, I, I really enjoy it. And, and again, the fans are so great. Unlike, I mean, I don't want to take a shot at Brooklyn Nets, but I feel that there's a bandwagon element to their fan base, Absolutely. but there's not enough fans. And I wrote in my playoff preview, and maybe Knicks fans are going to think I'm crazy. They're playing the Celtics, okay? Brooklyn is an important part of New York City. I hope Knicks fans could rally around the Brooklyn Nets when they play the Boston Celtics. Never. I mean, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, I, don't, I don't know about that. Nah, 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 nah. It's the Celtics. I mean, uh, I was born in Brooklyn and so many people were born in Brooklyn. I think I think some Knicks fans are going to maybe root for them in the first round at least. Yes. So much bad blood in history, man, between the Russian yeah. guy and Jay-Z, Blue Prince of Success. And, well, it's, oh, it's, my it's too much, gosh. Too much bad blood. Berman, too, Berman, too, Berman, maybe you could rub off some of that toughness to Julius so he knows he's in New York. <laughs> exactly. <'cause, laughs> you know, Julius is a tough player, though. He's a sensitive guy, but I'll tell you, he goes to that rim. There are few players with that ruggedness, you know, when he's in his right frame of mind. Ah. And there was some nights he was this year, year. He is tough to stop. He's a freight train going to that basket. So he's a rugged, rugged guy with a great build. I just hope he has that that fire next season and isn't so sensitive. I hope he's gone next season, personally. But that, Me too. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, have, I have a couple of more questions, only because it's, it's the fan chat questions. Uh, shout out to Fat Boy with Kicks. We said the twenty dollars super chat, so gun chats for you. It says question: Do you think not bringing back Bullock and Peyton has something to do with Randall's behavior? Love the show. Keep doing your thing. Appreciate you, bad boy with kicks, man. I, there's no doubt. I mean, I've probably written it, but uh, Julius was very close with Reggie and with Alfred. Uh, uh, Alfred and Julius played together in New Orleans. Right. Reggie and Julius just hit it off. I mean, they, they hit it off off the court and they had a very good connection on the court. Julius was finding Reggie for those open three pointers last season. And Julius never got that connection with Evan. Uh, maybe later in the season, they started to connect a little more. But without a doubt, I think Reggie is a great leader. I think Reggie would have gotten in Julius's face and said come on Julius you got to be the leader of this team mm. I think Julius really missed Reggie Bullock and I think Alfred is just a friend I mean he's just a friend and I think they played well together because they know each other and again Leon Rose had a big comment he said Julius just wasn't quote comfortable this season and I think he was alluding to with his teammates that's interesting that a little security blanket that I got traded so uh, that's an interesting perspective um also mm -hmm. A sh shout out to Adele Chapman, who sends a two dollars super chat. Says, "Any news about the Rokas meeting?" He's having a fine season in Barcelona. Uh, a point guard who has a good three point shot. He's a good ball handler. He he tr he works very hard and plays very hard. Defensively is the concern, but again, he's if you saw him in summer league, he definitely has a high intensity, yeah. and they were very impressed. Will they? Uh, do the it's a buyout he would have to have an expensive buyout with Barcelona definitely a possibility is he a starting point guard as a rookie no but you know he was the 35th pick they actually picked him 
over Herb Jones, if I have the name right, the young kid from New Orleans Pelicans, who is a defensive standout, and he's had a hell of a rookie year for New Orleans. Uh, I think Rokas was 34, Herb Jones was 35, mm. and then Miles McBride to the Knicks at 36. So they passed on Herb Jones, who I don't know if you guys know, I know Thibodeau likes him because he unsolicited mentioned him before a New Orleans game. But Rokas is definitely a prospect. It's just a European to come into the league as a rookie and be a starting point guard. It doesn't happen a lot. Yeah, I can see him in the back of Brule. I heard it might take two years for him to come. That's what I thought I read somewhere. I mean, that's a possibility that it might be uh, in, in, not next, not for next season, but the year after. Right. But we'll see. That this might be so desperate, they may say, come on, let's bring him in now. Right. Is he going to play in the summer league, Mark? Uh, very good possibility. Uh, he's still in Barcelona. They, they go till June with the uh, different types of the Euro championships and then the Spanish league. So there's a very good possibility he'll be at Summer League. And he's a good kid. They really were impressed with him in Las Vegas, I will say. Just his personality and the way he practiced and the and his work ethic. Okay, very last question. Cool. Um, uh, somebody asked, I'm sorry, shout out to Tremil White. He sends a five dollars super chat. It says, "What's the plan for Cam Reddish?" Boy, that was one question that we never asked Thibodeau. I know I asked Thibodeau uh, uh, in the second to last game of the season. Has Cam started shooting? What's he doing in rehab? He said, "No, nothing. He's still working on his shoulder. No basketball activities. Maybe in." four weeks or three and a half weeks when the team reconvenes the young players cam will be part of that group and start shooting the scouts love him Thibodeau does not love him he didn't he didn't show enough he started to show some glimmer some glimmers you know defensively he was playing harder and he was hitting some shots and running the uh, break well but he's got to convince Thibodeau and his season was cut short on very unfortunately that's like my number one concern over next season is I want to see something from Cam Reddish. I don't want him to be buried on the bench under Thibodeau. But thank you so much for joining us, Mark. Um, I know you want the people to definitely follow Mark Berman on Twitter if you haven't already. And definitely follow his newsletter, man. He has, he has a newsletter out and, that he puts out to the people. He does a lot of good work. He's very hardworking. And even though some Knicks fans are kind of polarizing on him, uh, he's a part of Knicks Nation, and unlike certain people, he won't block you. So, you know. <laughs> <laughs> no, he's the only. Uh, reporter. Is that he's an inside joke? That. Huh? Uh, has someone blocked you guys? Oh, um, actually, I haven't been blocked. I have, but I've known. Mm -hmm. I know a certain writer. I think. I think. I feel like you go back and forth with one. Of them. I think you have fun with, one, with the the guy I'm kind of referencing. But I've, he's been known to to block a lot of people on Knicks Nation. Oh, are we talking about Frankie? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. We talking yeah. about Frankie. Uh, <laughs> yeah, he blocked. <laughs> I've gotten into but, it with Frankie. He, he engages too. He he enjoys the back and forth. Yeah, he definitely he definitely engages though. He definitely engages though. But um, yo, Mark, tell him where, where your newsletter is too, for people to find it. We can put yeah, I mean, in, we in have a letter. new thing. This yeah, it's on the website. Uh, it's part of the Post Plus package. It's a subscription only, comes out every Thursday morning, goes right into your email box, and we put a lot of neat nuggets in it. You know, we this morning it came out, we did a, a, a thing on Donovan Mitchell uh, and what it will take and how Dwayne Wade could be a factor. He's a new minority owner of Utah. Uh, and we talked about the, the Knicks media policy. It was very tough to talk to the players we wanted to talk to this season. And Sunday was the last time we believed will be barred from the locker room. Nice. I believe, according to sources, that uh, even though Adam Silver was skeptical, I think we're making headway on being back in the locker room, able to talk to any player we want. We haven't spoken on Nerland's Noel since late November. Wow. We didn't get Randall after he shut it down. We haven't spoken to Derek Rose uh, since ja uh, late January. I mean, it, it, the access was, was really bad because of the pandemic-related rules. And the Knicks took full advantage of it in uh, keeping some players they didn't want us to talk to uh, away from us. Gotcha. All right. Oh, man. That's well, that, congratulations. Cause I know you like to be in close proximity with those players and 
talk to those guys in the bright in the in the locker room. You, got, you kind of get a better sense of what their mood is and how they feeling. Yeah. So I know you yeah. you're happy to get back to that type of life. Yeah, it's been two seasons where we haven't been in the locker room, and it's been very very frustrating. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. All right, Bill. Thanks for joining us, Berman. You you've been very generous with your time. Uh, don't want to hold you up any longer. I know you, you, you you're taking a plane, so have a safe trip. And every everybody, man, give a shout out to Berman, man. Give give us some some thumbs up, something. Hit that like button. Let them know that Berman did a great job, man. He, he informed us on a lot. Enjoy Thank Florida. You. It's real nice down there, right? Um, now. Yes, yeah, I, I'm looking forward to uh, getting away a little bit, guys. Thanks so much, J. Alex, Raw, Ryan. You guys uh, asked such great, insightful questions, and I really enjoyed my time. Absolutely, man. Ooh, thanks, man. Thank you. Thank you. Don't, Have a don't safe be a flight. stranger. Come back, Mark. Oh, sure. Just right. invite me. Yeah, I'll absolutely. Burns coming back. All right. <laughs> Peace. All right. Take care, guys. All right. Oh, you too, man. Take care. All right, then. Yeah. Dunch, man. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I enjoyed big that. Things one. are going yeah yeah shout out to this man i like that i enjoy it you know it's funny for all the crap that berman gets and this is my second interview with him because i've interviewed with interviewed him before um when i was working with cp he's very down to earth <laughs> yo he's the, i've never yeah, heard a guy definitely. say i'm not gonna block anybody yeah i've never heard any i've never heard any reporter say that yeah and he and he definitely will not and he actually cares i mean yeah. he actually you can tell he cares about the stuff i mean otherwise, he won my respect yeah. big time with that one though i'm not blocking anybody wow that's big time yeah yeah but shout yo shout out to the chat man so I'm, what do you think is there any standouts to anything that he said tonight guys let me know what you think i think at least for me the one of the most like surprising things that he told me was the fact that well he told us is that the fact that Thibs actually regrets yeah not playing the young players more towards the end of the season to me that was shocking I was like that was wow. shocking that was totally shocking but you know it helped, that taught me when he said that that the focus level that Thibodeau has is such of a high degree that once he sets his mind on something it's like a train coming down the track. You can't stop it, you know? Yeah. So that's, pro and then afterward, he probably contemplated, started contemplating the season and came to the conclusion, you know what, maybe I should, I mean, what was obvious to all of us, but he was so focused on what he right. had already decided to do. But now that's a good sign. Maybe next season we'll get some more playing time for the kids. Man. May, maybe. Yeah. It, was, it was telling to me that Tom Thibodeau's last interview, he actually mentioned that you know, I'm I work hard, I work hard, I work hard. But at the end of those statement, he actually said, you know, I don't get it right 100 percent of the time, but I work hard. Like that's that's the that's the that's most the first time he yeah. did something like that. I've yep. ever exactly. heard him take any type of accountability. That's right. Ever, even a little bit, because it's been deflecting the whole season. That's so, right. I wonder, man, now that I'm thinking about it. I mean, I was trying to get through these questions. That that might have been a good backup question, a follow up question, because I wonder if they expounded on that behind the scenes. Because because Mark because Mark definitely said that he 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 got that sense that he was regretful. So, yeah. yeah, he said. I think he actually said that Tibbs said he wished he had played the young kids more. And then when I asked him about Deuce, he said he wished he had given Deuce more time. Yeah, that, that was that was like so for the kid to score nineteen points one game. Then you know four points the next game, and then not to see the, not to see the court for, for like that long months. a time. <laughs> yeah. yeah, which is crazy to me. Like yeah. I get benching him to to you know okay reset. This is what you do now, mm -hmm. but just like Ob Toppin, yep, that takes your confidence. And you seen you seen the reckless abandon he came in when he when he he came to the game with and he scored those nineteen points. Yeah, versus when he came back, he seemed timid. And then when you watch the summer league games, when he's able to be freely do his thing, he's like a whole different. It's a different player. guy, different guy, yeah, <laughs> different guy. You, you know, and it's guy. kind of it's kind of baffling to me too because even though Thibs gave IQ time at point guard and it was a revelation to us how IQ can play point guard, it's kind of surprising to me that you knowing that McBride is actually a more natural point guard than IQ, why he didn't 
try to, you know, push McBride as a point guard and then push IQ next to him so they could both play in the natural positions and see how more of how they would play together in that role. I agree. Yeah, that's true, man. And, and it's I, interesting. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> oh, I, and I was going to say, and me personally, I still like the... I still like the prospect of having IQ learn some point guard. I feel like he's did a, a decent job, especially towards the end. But I feel like the bigger thing was Alec Burks playing oh, all yeah. those minutes at point guard and oh, having man. McBride <laughs> oh, at least play the other minutes. <laughs> oh, God. You know, and the thing, the thing is, is that what Berman said, two things that he noticed that all of us noticed, which is good. He noticed two things. Bur Burks is an off the bench scorer from the forward spot. And he also noticed that when, when Deuce was in the game, they kept throwing him in the corner and letting IQ run the show instead of letting Deuce play his natural role and let IQ be on the wing, which right. would have been more effective. But um, that, And that's what they did in Houston. He also mentioned Houston because in Houston, Deuce had the ball in his hand and IQ was the off guard. And that, and that worked out very well. And so I'm hoping that because I really do, I think I said, I think there was a disconnect. Tibbs has a disconnect in that he's thinking we're all criticizing him for not working hard. We're not, we're criticizing him for not being modern, yeah. for not seeing, you know, the game as it is now. And so hopefully as he reviews all of these games with the things in mind that both that uh, Berman mentioned in terms of, I could have played the kids more. Maybe I want to look at Deuce more at the point guard. Maybe he comes into the summer league and then, you know, this, the training camp with more of an idea because I don't really think we need to scour the earth for a point guard. I think I we think got so him, either. you know, yeah. but, but um, let's see what happens with Leon because t I mean, he also said that they were desperate for a point guard. So I'm like, yeah. well, what did they, I don't know. That's what he, he used the word desperate Mark, Mark did. He said yeah, they're desperate to get a point guard. Yeah. Um, you don't want to say something, Ryan? Yeah. Because you know, it just dawns me right now because you know, like, you know, how oh, how we've been seeing throughout the season, Mark Berman mentioned it too, that Fibs like big, like, like, likes big point guards. That's why Alec Burks took over once Rose went down with the injury and once Kemba was, you know, pretty much, you know, pushed to the wayside. So my thing is, do you think things would have been different if I could make Rob and McBride were both 6'5"? Do you think it would oh, be a bit sure. different? Oh, oh man. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yo, I just, we, I just... That's it. But I post that on Instagram or Twitter. I was just saying that if McBride and IQ were six five, they would have been starting because every yep. metric says they've been better than Alec Burks at the point guard situation. Right. Right. Like so, I I just don't get it. Like, even IQ, if you're looking at his assist numbers versus Alec Burks, he averages more assists than Burks with less minutes. Yes. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. So <laughs> what, I, but what I don't understand is if Tibbs thought that, why did he push to get McBride, who he knew was six two? Yeah, that, that's true too. I don't go. I don't know. That makes no sense. I mean, if he if he's like, well, I need six five point guards, he could have got one last draft. They could have got some, but they decided to go in this direction. They they have what is the kid that, that ends up in um, uh, Oklahoma City? He's six five. The boy from Florida. He's six five. Oh, um, um, is it is it Trey Man? No, Trey Man. He, he oh, oh no, Trey Man. He ended yeah. up. He could have got Trey Man if they could have got yeah. that if they wanted six five. That's you know, fact. but you know, but so I'm like, I don't understand what what was the if that was the infatuation. Why did they go ahead? And then he said he really likes Deuce and he wants to get more time. He's six two, but I just think, I mean, in that particular sense, um, the height won't matter with Deuce McBride. He's going to lock up whoever you put in front of him. So I, I don't. I'm not worried about that. But I'm just saying. If the rationale was Burks was six six, that that's not a good. That doesn't make any sense to me. Because yeah, IQ could have yeah. did just as good a job or better at the point guard spot. Yeah, I agree with you. True. Man. And uh, to, to me, that part and the Cam Reddish thing is still the most oh. alarming thing to me. Because when we talk about the top reasons for me to move Tom Thibodeau, one is the accountability for, for Julius Randle and his ineptitude and in me able to apply his, his lack of accountability to Julius Randle. The other part is. He's devaluing our young assets. And if, if he does what he did this year, next year, to Cam Reddish, to right. Grimes, because right. all these young guys only got time because somebody else was injured, whether it be Cam Reddish, whether it be Grimes, whether even IQ's extended minutes, uh, McBride, if no one was injured, they would have been stuck on the bench. Right. So, and even down to Obi Toppin, who, I don't, and I don't know if Randall's injury was real or not, but if those guys would have got time earlier i don't know if we'd be talking about you know we don't know what we have next year 
or these guys not not be good enough to be to put in a trade package. Not that I want to trade pack it, not that I want to trade them, but their value will be a lot higher than it is today. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, no, but you know what? But they have played now, so you can't ignore the fact that they did put like he has played IQ, he has played OB now, so you can't look back now. So he's got he's already played them. So now uh, you're dealing with OB Toppin's going to be a third year guy, and you're going to de- IQ is going to be a third year guy. So you can't look back now. It's not like the cat's out the bag. I guess what I'm saying. Grimes is out the bag. He's going to play now. So I don't think um, Tibbs is going to put them back in the doghouse. You know, next year. It depends. If Leon goes and gets another bunch of veterans, yeah. But uh, if he doesn't, um, I think those guys are all going to play. If Derek, man, yeah. if Derek Rose is here with Alec Burks and Evan Fournier, yeah, yeah, that's it's going to get rough. Like, that's okay, be Grimes might yeah. be, maybe he'll play, but I'm still not convinced he's going to play more than those. Guys. I agree. I agree. Yeah. I agree. They got to move the, two or three. Two of those three have to be moved. Absolutely, which is why I keep saying, as much as I love Alec Burks, he has to go. Not yeah, because I don't go. like yeah. him. I don't just I just don't trust Tibbs. I just don't yeah, trust Tibbs. Exactly. Be you already know what it is. Yeah, exactly. Tibbs exactly. Be exactly. Yeah, but, but 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 here's the crazy thing though, because when you think about it, it's like okay, Tibbs wants to win, right? You're right. So okay, so you want to win, and you know that if Tibbs like because Mark as Mark Berman said, the Knicks want to push for that star player, right? If if a star becomes disgruntled. Thibs is going to be at the front office and he's going to be like, I want this guy. Do anything you can to bring this guy here. So if you know for a fact that to get this guy to come to New York through trade and you need to possibly sell young players to get this player here, wouldn't you as a coach want to play those young guys yeah. more I, I, so, you just, increase, so, you can, so you can increase their value? The math Ryan, don't be math. Ryan, come on, Ryan. The math Ryan, don't be math, and Ryan. <laughs> Rocket, you, you're making too much sense. The math you're don't be logic. math. <laughs> come on, man. Jeez, jeez, y'all, man. All <laughs> He's right, acting Lord. like Chips is going to follow some sort of logic. I mean, come on. Well, exactly. It's a nerve. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yo, but yo, sh- yo, shout out to the chat, man. This has been a great show. I need to do more interviews. Listen, listen, guys. I'm gonna tell you right now. Next, whoever you want me to interview, us to interview, go on Twitter and tag them. All right, I'm asking you guys to go on Twitter and tag them. I know, I know, people, people seen they want us to talk to Monica McNutt. I've seen Ian Begley. Ooh, bring I, Monica. I, on. I've seen a few. Whoever you want us to interview next, go on and tag them. All right, let them know that we do a good job. We did a good job here with Berman. We can do a good job with those guys as well. All right. So shout out oh, to you I like, guys. If you could bring a Monica, or oh, how about um Rebecca Harlow? Now nah, you can't get her. Rebecca Harlow. <laughs> <laughs> no, tag her. I don't care. Tag anybody. Yeah, tag I mean, her. she's in. She's too. inside. You know what I'm saying? She's inside. So I'm saying that's she, fine. She'll be outside. Uh, maybe you know she might, she might have more time. You know, she inside. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> she inside. She but I wouldn't mind. I, seriously, though, I wouldn't mind Monica McNutt. No, she she I, she really she's a good analyst. Uh, you know, she is really. She knows her stuff. So yeah, I would definitely like. Monica McNutt. Absolutely. Man. Talk to Ron. Yo, hold on. Shout out to Ron Cleveland, man. Shout Ron, out to Ron Cleveland. Shout out to Ron Cleveland, Ron Cleveland in, the in the building. Man, James Boogie in the, man, Jay Boogie in the man. Yo, Ron, you got to link up, Ron. We got, we got a link, Ron. I don't even know how to con. Jay Boogie's in the house? Jay, Jay Boogie's, Boogie's in the closes in the house, too. Shout out oh to Oh, my God. Yeah, man. But shout out to everybody in the chat. Shout out to Shells. Shells Heavy. Mr. Absolute. Knicks Nation 112. Uh, St- Stephen W. T. Williams. Picks for Timmy, all my usual mods, JT Riddick, Sherwin, even though he Sherwin be trolling, but he be here. Shout out to you. <laughs> <laughs> Shout that's powers. The, that, that's the troll supreme. You should change his name to Troll Supreme, man. Uh, for real. When it comes to OB and IQ, yeah. that man be going on and on. <laughs> absolutely. Exactly. Absolutely. Exactly. Absolutely. But shout out to all you guys, man. It's been a great show. Um and yeah, I wanna go, I wanna I wanna talk about like a review show next week. But um, so we'll, we'll we'll schedule that to talk about you know, you know, the review of the guys, the Julius Randles and the Obi Toppins, to talk about that. Um, but also, I don't know if you guys know the um, we've been interviewed. They interviewed KFTV, they interviewed KOT, and they interviewed T- Terry and Trey. And uh, the guy who wrote the article wants to interview us too. So I'm hoping to have some of like the old KOT back. And do like an interview of, about with him about the KOT show and its inception and stuff like that. All right, that'd be so, good. That'd be good, man. That'd be so definitely, definitely be those. So yeah. take a look out for that as well. All right, 
And hold up, shout out to wait. I'm, I'm missing super chats. I'm missing super chats. JT Reddick, baby. JT Reddick. I'm missing super chats. Hold on, I don't want to be disrespectful because y'all spent your your, your hard earned money. All right, my thing is slowing down. So year, shout out to my guy JT Reddick. <laughs> the year, it says salute, fellas. Great interview. Nice. Okay. I think I saw another super chat earlier. Did I acknowledge him? Because sometimes I'm forgetting. Let me see. Sal- uh, so Hamish. Hamish sent a ten dollars super chat. Says happy to support your chat. Salute to you, Hamish. I think I don't think I've ever seen you before. So thank you for yeah. The Hamish super chat. is a regular. He's a regular. He's okay, you yeah, have okay, okay. Shout out yeah, to he's you, Hamish. A regular. Shout out to you. Yes, and and people in the chat. I mean, I see two hundred eighteen watch right now, but the likes is only at one forty seven. Come on, get us a two hundred. Come on. Yeah, man. Right. If you it spill, can't, it can't be that. Not that much Berman hate. Come on, y'all. <laughs> if, <laughs> if you spill in the interview, was we'll, we'll get these likes up, and um, yeah, we we gonna close it out, right? All right, we'll close it out. Cool, cool. So um, my man from the YouTube channel across the street. Um. Oh, yeah, there's no phones today. Sorry, Jay Boogie. There's no phones today. Um, maybe next week we'll have a phone. But my answer to YouTube channel across the street, let us know where they can find you, sir. Raw Hebrew Remnant on YouTube. Raw Hebrew Remnant on Twitter. And Raw Hebrew Remnant Repping on uh, Patreon. Yeah, and I want to thank you all for the Patreon donations. There are yes. people that really lives are being really affected in the philippines uh with those donations so thank you very much absolutely absolutely i need to, i actually want to i need to incorporate some donations with this show as well to go to the cause i, I, I want to do that for, for real um but um let me find a cause though all right ryan let us know where we can find you sir <laughs> you can find me on instagram at sir g is chilling sir g, sir g, is, g chilling. is chilling hey <laughs> that's s-i-r-g is c-h-i L-L-I-N. You can also find me at Sergi's Corner where I talk sports and Knicks basketball. That's going to be back soon enough. And you can also find me on Twitter at Ryan G-K-O-T. All right. Also, to let you know, we are 30 subscribers away from 7K. So if you have not, Ooh. please hit that subscribe button. I really want to get to the 10K. I really want to get to 10K, but we got to get to 7K first. That's and right. It's a special yeah. reason why I want to get to 10K. Um, And, and listen, man, I know I talked about K-O-T. Shout out to K-Steele. Shout out to Edson Sean. Uh, my my guys who we started with, I really want to do like an in person KOT again. I really want to do that, and if we get to 10k, I feel like we'll be able to do it times like times 50, like on steroids. Oh, shoot. Because oh, shoot. once you get to 10k, <laughs> what you guys don't know, once you get to 10k, you get access to these super professional sleek cameras and lights. Oh, and, I didn't know that. Okay. Yeah, oh, yeah. Right. Exactly. Exactly. And, and so I want to bring I want to bring out the original KOT, even if it's not just like every week like we used to. Maybe it's like once every four months or something, just to like you know catch mm-hmm. up on Next Nation. Yeah, you know what I'm saying. I don't, like that's still <laughs> bring back the OG vibes. Man, bring back the OG vibes, and then whenever whenever Raw's in in New York, you can come by. <laughs> man, if y'all if y'all gonna do it, if y'all gonna do it like that, I'll make a trip. Ah oh, man, like, listen. Yeah. We have to make that happen, man. Yeah, if y'all gonna yeah, do it like facts. that, I make a trip, man. If you're flowing like that, we're gonna be there up in BK, BK, and right. baby, right? Because, yes, sir, because shout out to people who do spaces. I, I see, um, <laughs> spaces is kicking off in Nick's Nation, and it gives me that old school KOT feel, man. It really does, man. It gives that when we're, everybody's in the same space, even though they're not in the same space, but it's a little bit more raw conversation. It's like, I like that. I like that barbershop type of energy. Yeah, man. It'd be good, man. Yeah, but but shout out to you guys. Shout out to <laughs> shout out to um shout out to Julito who does spaces. Shout out to I think State does spaces spaces too. Um shout out to Nick's Buzz too, who's done a Mark Berman interview. Who shout out to you, shout out to Man 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 Show, all Nick's Nation. Um that's our show, man. I don't, let's get out of here. Thanks for rocking with us. Um and as Beautiful. always, you already know what it is. Shout out the World Beautiful. Wide West. Everywhere we go, we leave a worldwide mess. <laughs> mess is out here in these next YouTube streets. That is our show. We are out of here. Peace. Right.